So I'm just going to say welcome everybody to our uh, first uh, Shorebirds of the Atlantic Flyway webinar. Um, we're hoping to do another one of these in October, so stay tuned for the details of that one. Um, so we've just finished celebrating World Shorebirds Day and we're getting ready to celebrate World Migratory Bird Day on the 8th of October. So we thought it would be a good time to have a webinar featuring shorebirds and wetlands in the Caribbean. But also, uh, this symposium uh, was uh, hosted by Birds Caribbean at the AOS Birds Caribbean joint meeting in the summer. And we know that lots of people didn't get a chance to go to that meeting or some people went to the meeting but didn't see the symposium. Um, so we wanted to share some of the amazing talks. We had 16 amazing talks at the symposium. So we just wanted to share some of those talks with everybody. Um, so hopefully people who missed out will be catching up with them today. Um, so obviously the Caribbean is a really important place for migratory shorebirds. It's a link between the breeding grounds in the north and the wintering grounds in the south. And they come and use our wetlands to kind of refuel and rest on their migration. And some birds will use Caribbean wetlands to spend the whole winter. Um, so they're really important places, but they're also really threatened places from things like development and climate change. And also lots of shorebird populations are declining on the Atlantic Flyway. So this is all really important work that we're sharing with you, um, talking about trying to conserve wetlands and preserving these habitats for shorebirds and the other wildlife that uses them. So our symposium in the summer featured work from the Caribbean and beyond, um, featuring work that was uh, for protecting wetlands, work that was on outreach and education projects, and work that was directly on um, conserving shorebirds. And tonight we're going to feature three talks, and these are all from the Caribbean. Um, across all the speakers, we're going to find out about um, some of the struggles that we face in wetland conservation, some of the lessons we can learn from those struggles. Um, we're going to find out about outreach and education work and also some really inspiring stories about restoration work. So thank you to all three of tonight's speakers for agreeing to take part in our webinar. Um, and first up uh, tonight, we have Jody Daniel. She's the executive director for the Gaia Conservation Network in Grenada, um, and she's going to be uh, talking to us about wetlands and the development pressure they face in Grenada. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and so Jodi can share hers and get started on her fantastic talk. Oh, thanks. <clears throat> thanks, Alex. I'm just going to share my screen. I'm assuming everyone can see my screen um, pretty clearly. Um, so <clears throat> thanks again, Alex, for the introduction. As you mentioned, my name is Jody. I work with um, Gaia Conservation Network in Grenada. And <clears throat> our work in wetlands has largely been influenced by interests in really um, improving mangrove restoration rates in Grenada in collaboration with the Grenada Fund for Conservation, who has been doing this sort of work for the last 15 years or so. And in our attempt to do some of this work and in, including some, a lot of monitoring in wetlands, we came across many instances of, you know, when we have large attempts to conserve these wetland habitats and because they're coastal, they're often considered valuable for coastal development. And so really in this talk, I'm gonna give you a short overview of some of the things, challenges we faced in our attempt to can, um, conserve this habitat. Um, we also did um, a recent paper, Mangroves for Money, um, the ecological and social impacts of recent development projects in mangrove forest in Grenada. Um, so, so that gives you a really good overview of what I'll be talking to today, but it also focuses on the ecological, the economic and the cultural impacts of, cultural importance, sorry, of these wetland areas. So as we are well aware, um, mangroves are really important habitat for migratory birds. Mangroves are on off, usually they're coastal. And this particular figure here is showing you a mock-up of what we may see in many of the wetlands in Grenada. This one is modeled after one in the south, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, so typically you would find 
um, red mangroves closer to the water. So those are the ones with those prop roots and nearby you'd find seagrass beds and a lot of fish, um, usually transitioning into white. Then we, in the mudflat area, we would see black. And then further inland, we see transitions into white. Um, but you'd notice that the differences in vegetation height and the differences in, in, in water, du water um, duration can really influence the type of birds that we see occupying this space. So we see birds that are typically considered shorebirds, um, and so like the sandpipers and turnstones, and then we have those that would be considered um, more forest dwelling or terrestrial birds like broadwing hawks or even a grenade of flycatcher. So in these mangrove habitats, we are providing habitat for both residents and migratory species. So they're really, really critical important and uh, critically important as Alex mentioned. Um, in the Caribbean, they're often providing stopover habitat for these migratory birds. But as I mentioned before, these areas are coastal, and because they're coastal, they're often targeted for development projects. So between 2019 and 2020, we um, were selecting sites in order to do some mangrove monitoring. We wanted some sites that would be really good baseline sites to establish what is a biological, um, what do we typically see with birds, plants, um, aquatic macroinvertebrates um, in these particular wetlands. And so we had scouted a few and <laughs> during our site selection, we had come to realize um, that many of them were actually again targeted for coastal development. So I'll just point some of these out to you on this map. Um, so get my pointer. So in the south of the island, we have the Mount Hatman Natural Park, which is also where we'd find one of the subpopulations of Grenada's critically endangered um, national bird, the Grenada dove. Um, nearby, there is a wetland we selected for monitoring there, and that is at, um, was an area carted for a mega resort. And another wetland we were intending to use, which was a popular birding site in Grenada, um, was one that is to the east of that in Lassages. Um, at this point, um, there is no wetland of much to monitor. And then further, the, the, the north of the island um, is where we have the only Ramsar protected wetland on, protected wetland in Grenada, which we also selected as a baseland site, but it's also targeted for quota hotel development and other mega resorts. So we'll just chronicle some of the, the, the habitat loss we've seen. So in Lassages, which is a site that is in the south of the island, the southeast of the island, um, this is showing you um, the mangrove forest that was destroyed in green in 2020. And then the coastal vegetation was moved a little bit after. So all of this in red was eventually removed by February, 2020. And then following in August, we had the removal of all the vegetation on the headlands. So we lost both uh, mangrove and coastal forest as well. So what we knew was present in last just um, based on um, eBird records going up to before the 2000s, at least 96 different species of birds. Our surveys in the area suggested that there are more than at least 10 different um, families of fish, at least two um, species of turtles. We know nest on the beach, we're used to hawksbill turtles and, and we'd see green, so green sea turtles often are in here. Um, and one thing we noted now, because the vegetation is now gone, as you would see here, there were past tracks of hawksbill coming up to nest, but there's no dense vegetation that they would need. So this was a photo taken in 2019 when we were going to do some um, inventory work. And then this is what the site looks like since July. Go to another site. Um, this site is Liver. So that's a site that's at the, the north of the island. Um, so this particular site has been targeted for development numerous times over the last 20 years. Um, and because of past development projects, we had massive vegetation removal in yellow here. So that's just from past projects that didn't continue, they failed. Um, then recently there was a worker housing built. And then following this total forest area is on the track for the development. And then we have the, the mangrove forest here. Um, that's also under threat for development. So Lavera, um, this is a picture we took in 2020, and this is the Walker housing that was built um, recently, and then they've done some road expansions. So 
based on surveys of the pond itself and the beach, we know that there are between 54 to 65 different species of birds that use there. Um, a majority of these birds are water birds. You notice there's a massive pond there. Um, based on surveys by the Grenada Coral Reef Foundation, we know that at least 14 different families of fish out here, um, 13 different species of coral, and then two different species of um, turtles should know that this particular beach um, is really, really important for Lothabacter atolls. It's one of the largest nesting sites in the entire region. And so in, with past developments, what had happened is in an attempt to build a golf course, there was a lot of silt that ended up on this beach, which made things very difficult for turtles. And now we're having this, a similar project coming again. So it's not just the birds, but then you also may have that impacts on turtles as well. And this is just a project that's proposed. And final site I'll cover would be Mount Hartman. So Mount Hartman is in the south of, south of Grenada. Um, and as I mentioned before, Mount Hartman um, is where you'd find one of the two subpopulations of the Grenada dove. The Grenada dove is critically endangered. There are fewer than 250 birds based on point count surveys done in 2013. And territorial mapping suggests maybe fewer, even fewer. So maybe as <laughs> little as 190 birds left. So this this habitat is critically important for Grenada doves. And when we've done surveys in this area, we, we have heard Grenada doves calling along this headland. So the development happening here, we're not just impacting the migratory birds that use the space, but we're also impacting the Grenada dove, which may be foraging within this entire area. So in yellow, we had where vegetation was removed in 2020, um, additional in 20, August 2020. Um, and this is the total forest area that's on the threat. Um, this is one of the mang this is one of the wetlands that we surveyed, which is on the threat. Um, and yeah, this one of the wetlands we surveyed, which is also on the threat. Um, this particular wetland kind of does not really exist anymore. Um, so this photo here would have been much earlier. And as you can see, um, the headland is separated, separating two two wetlands. The one on the right is the one where we surveyed and the one on the left. Um, much of the vegetation has been removed, you'd see, by July 2020. And um, some habitat removal has happened on the headland itself. Um, and this is the wetland here that we've done surveys. Um, you'd notice that based on surveys, based on eboard records, we know that they're between 32 to 66 species using on um, both of these um, wetlands, um, at least 18 different species of fish. Um, this particular site has a big, large amounts of, I'm sorry, my screen may pause weirdly, um, <laughs> large amounts of black mangrove, which is not necessarily something we see at all wetlands, but you'd notice that the footprint of this project is massive and we're likely going to lose a lot of the coastal forests as well as the wetlands would be completely um, changed. So some of the economic impacts of the loss of this mangrove habitat. So based on the three, this is just showing you a proportion of um, the size of wetlands in proportion, comparing them, Lavera being the biggest. Um, we would expect um, if we were to lose all of these mangroves, um, the amount of carbon destruction Carbon, carbon that will be released in the process. Um, this is just a raw, um, raw estimate based on the size of the wetlands. And then finally, the value of the mangrove ecosystem services, we show both that and the, last, the likely costs for mangrove restoration. Um, this Grenada is a small economy. Um, spending that much into restoration is, is going to be a task, but also there are numerous ecosystem services we're losing when we lose this valued habitat. And Something that doesn't always come up, but these wetlands, particularly in Grenada, based on work by Dr. Jonathan Hanna, has shown that they act as time capsules into Grenada's history. Um, I'm not an archaeologist, so I can't go into much detail, but I can tell you that at the last just wetland, the developer did pay for an excavation, and they did find um, burials there. And in, in this particular case, I think it was a... Um, base I think they did that was included in genetic studies. It may have been a um, indigenous individual. Um, and when we, 
when we do not properly uh, manage these sites, this is the information we lose. Um, it gives us a bit of a history into the, the, the use of, of, of grenadic habitats, just how like our first peoples would have been using the areas and wetlands are, are, are hot spots. So when we target these areas for coastal development, we're not just seeing impacts from an economic or ecological part, um, perspective, we're also seeing a massive loss to our cultural history. Um, and again, this is kind of covered in the paper I've mentioned before. You can go into a lot more detail there. So you may ask, what have we done or what have we been attempting to do? Um, civil society has attempted to rally to really advocate for better uh, management of these ecosystems, better consultations with people who live in Grenada on when these projects are going to happen and what could be the potential impact. So there have been attempts to have um, consultations with physical planning authority who's in, who gives permission to do these developments, as well as the developers themselves. And those were um, largely um, unsuccessful. Um, th there has been consistent calls for public consultation um, among many civil society groups. And there was one that happened but with one of the projects, but that didn't didn't go well so I think the developer did not feel as motivated to continue um, but the problem with these consultations is not that they're happening before they're happening after and sometimes after vegetation has already been removed so people often go to these meetings pretty fired up um, we have attempted to get information on what are the conditions for the approval of these projects and um, what were the considerations made when giving these approvals, which, which were unsuccessful. So at this point, a judicial review was filed by the Grenada Land and Actors. Um, and in that judicial review, it's really asking the court to do a couple of things. One of them is to ensure that Grenada's registry is, is, is up to date. So if as a Grenadian, I go there and ask for information on a, on a project, it, sh it should be there, which has not always been the case and also having access to these documents. So it's, it's, it has been in the past very difficult to get access to EIAs and, and planning permissions and so on. And it's also asking the court to have a reconsideration of how these projects um, were approved, considering the fact that they're happening in really, really ecologically sensitive and important areas. And so I'll just list some of the civil society organizations that have been part of advocating for the protection of Grenada's natural resources, some focus culturally, some focus more on public consultation, some focus on ecological impacts, but we are generally concerned about how our resources are managed and ensuring that development, when we look back 10 to 20 years from now, we still have um, pretty intact ecosystems. And, and, and much of the monitoring has been funded by Environment Climate Change Canada, so I just wanted to mention that. And, and that's the end. And this is just a really cool video we had um, from outside one of our wetland sites. Um, it was a bit turbid that day, but it's just showing you that, yes, these wetland areas are important and they're connected to other ecosystems. And when we lose a wetland, we are going to see impacts in other, in other parts of our income. So I'll turn it back to Alex if there aren't any questions. Yeah, I think there probably are questions. Um, <laughs> uh, we'll do a couple now. I'll have a look in the Q&A first. Okay. We have a couple of questions in the Q&A that I can do now. So Sonia Compton asks a couple of questions. Have you or your organization been in the draft marine spatial planning and coastal development plan consultations? Um, and also, do you think the new administration in Grenada are going to take like a better approach to coastal development? I'm paraphrasing her question. <laughs> to the first question, no, like not our organization directly has not been involved in that. Um, and as a result of the new administration, we're, we're hopeful. Um, their manifesto had mentioned lots of concern for environmental impacts. So we're, if we're taking a lead from that, we're hopeful that 
they would be a bit more holistic when we're thinking about development in Grenada and not just focus on building a bunch of mega resorts <laughs> um, that the scale is it's very crazy for the landscape. A one of them being a 16-story um, hotel in the north of the island takes you two hours to get there from the airport. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, we're hopeful that their their approach to 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 management of resources would be a bit different. Great, thanks. I've got one more quick question because I'm curious about this too. It's more of a political question. So Emma Lewis asked that the new, UN, the new UN climate chief is uh, the Grenadian former minister for the environment. Mm -hmm. And he's, she's saying, how can the EU has been approved under his watch? And I was very curious about that when I heard he'd been appointed. <laughs> I don't know if you have anything to comment on that. Um, my answer to that is I don't know. Um, <laughs> we're still trying our best to get as much information as possible. The, the thing particularly in Grenada is... Um, the, the planning approval process more recently for this project happened where um, the developer submits the EIA and then a committee reviews it. Um, there may be representation from environment. We don't know what different um, departments may have had or said on, on what their concerns were. So maybe environment had concerns on the EIA committee and they may have been incorporated. We, we can't say, and that's one of the reasons we have judicial, judicial review. To ensure that this information is more transparent so I could say something oh yeah environment actually raised a protest about this but I can't really say because these discussions are behind closed doors including the planning approval process okay thanks Jody. we might have some time for some more questions at the end of all the talks so uh, keep your questions for Jody till then and I think we'll move on to the next talk now so our next talk is going to be given by Joshelle Wilson he works for the Environmental Awareness Group in Antigua, or EAG, and he's going to speak about um, some work they've been doing to improve the wetlands in Antigua and also outreach work to raise awareness about shorebirds and wetlands. So great, I'm going to hand over to you now, Joshelle. Thank you, Alex. Is everyone seen okay? Yes. All right, cool. Okay, so good day, everyone. Um, my name is Joshua Wilson, as uh, Alex said, and I'm the wildlife officer here in Antigua and Barbuda, and I work for the Environmental Awareness Group, also known as EAG. Um, and I'm here to show you, to present to you how the EAG is improving wetland habitats and raising awareness about shorebirds here in Antigua and Barbuda. So just a little background information about who the EAG is. The EAG is the oldest environmental NGO in Antigua and Barbuda. Uh, we have been at the forefront of conservation work for over 30 years. Uh, our aim is to have a society where everyone cares for and values the ecosystem and wildlife of Antigua and Barbuda. Uh, that's why our tagline is for the benefit of people and wildlife. Uh, we also believe that environmental work should not only be worthwhile, but interesting and satisfying with a hint of adventure. So just some information about Antigua and Barbuda. Antigua and Barbuda is part of the Lesser Antilles in the Caribbean. The island is 108 square miles and it is relatively flat with a few elevated areas. Uh, there are no rivers, but there are a few open water sources like salt ponds and yeah, it's like salt ponds uh, located on the island. Okay, so what is the problem? Antigua and Barbuda has seen an increase in illegal dumping at important bird and biodiversity areas across the island. And illegal dumping has had severe environmental impacts on the local ponds, wetlands, and beaches. It has caused damage to our soil quality, it has affected air quality through the process of open burning and most importantly damaging of our water sources because of this problem we have been because this problem has been ignored and has been and has not been solved it is negatively impacting wildlife such as shorebirds and fish that live in mangroves and near our beaches you might be asking yourself uh, what does how does the eeg tackle this illegal dumping challenge. So we intro I'm introducing you to one of our own uh, birding group, 
or Burning Club called the Wadadley Wobblers. It's a burning club formed in 2020 as a, as a way for persons to keep themselves occupied during the COVID pandemic. Uh, it has become a stepping stone for first time birders to learn about their local bird species. And the club has consists of over 30 local enthusiastic birders who are keen in identifying water birds, land birds, shorebirds, and helping conserve Antigua and Barbuda's wetland ecosystems. So given the interest of these locals, uh, we took this as an opportunity uh, to provide training and capacity building for members so they can conduct surveys as citizen scientists, while also helping to raise awareness about the things we can do to help uh, the birds here in Antigua and Barbuda. On the right of the screen, you can see uh, the Wadadley Wobblers logo, which was made by one of their own members, and it consists of Antigua and Barbuda's only endemic bird species, which is the Barbuda Wobbler, which is only found on the island of Barbuda, to be, to be exact. So, a huge positive impact of the Wobblers would be their dedication to assist us in our annual Caribbean Waterbird Census which is a region-wide wetland bird and water bird monitoring program headed by Birds Caribbean. But they also participate in regular counts for important birding events uh, throughout the year, including Global Big Day, the Endemic Bird Festival, the Caribbean Endemic Bird Festival, and World Migratory Bird Day. So since 2021, the Wadali Wawas Birding Club has assisted the EAG in its annual CWC, or Caribbean Water Bird Census, conducting point counts, travel counts, area counts uh, at our important bird and biodiversity areas. The data collected by the wobblers helps us keep track of the different species of shorebirds that, that are used in Antigua and Barbuda's wetlands. And since we conduct uh, site descriptions at each site, we get, an, we get a better understanding of the threats these shorebirds face throughout the island. And it seems to be one common threat would be waste pollution or illegal dumping. However, we've got a solution for that. Introducing Trash Challenge in Antigua and Barbuda, a local cleanup effort started in 2019 to curb plastic pollution in Antigua and Barbuda. So this challenge was intended as a one-year activity, but has become an annual feature of the EEG's work program uh, as hundreds find hundreds of individuals find purpose in volunteering their efforts in the removal of waste from beaches and wetlands. Armed with information on how to remove how the removal of plastic and other waste has a positive impact on habitats of migratory and shorebirds, this program continues to reach many locals through its simple design and execution. Additionally, Trash Challenge arms volunteers with the tools to upload collected data to the CleanSwell app, which is used for International Coastal Cleanup Day, which is this Saturday. <laughs> uh, this strong focus on volunteerism, bird-friendly activities, and citizen science is important uh, for, continue, for continued environmental uh, advocacy in Antigua and Barbuda. This challenge was previously <laughs> sponsored by Birds Caribbean. However, it has transformed and been supported by local businesses and organizations to date. And through this challenge, we hope that the effects of waste pollution on threatened coastal ecosystems can be reversed. All right. So to complement the cleanup, uh, we also engage in several outreach activities that introduce persons to the wonderful world of birding. Here, here at the EAG, we believe that anyone can bird, no matter the circumstances in life. We all can take the time off to learn about all the amazing things that birds can do for us and the environment. One of the ways we can do this is by conducting educational outreach activities with different schools, organizations, and persons. Uh, these outreach activities are aimed at giving an individual the knowledge and practical skills needed to identify different species of birds, while also having fun and enjoying the tranquility of nature. Uh, some of our outreach activities occur within the Caribbean Endemic Bird Festival. So this is where we would educate the public by either having a bird masquerade, or bird nesting building session with local preschools, uh, teaching primary school students how to identify local birds, uh, conducting field trips to our offshore islands with the Antigua State College students, 
and teaching the Antigua and Barbuda Association for Persons with Disabilities how to identify birds on their own property. So to ensure these educational outreach activities are working, uh, we design knowledge, attitude, and practice studies to measure the level of change in knowledge among residents in Antigua and Barbuda. And because of the COVID pandemic, we have had to reevaluate and had to adapt to the limited interactions with large groups. So we've created virtual videos and educational materials uh, to fill that gap. These educational videos can be found on our YouTube channel, EAG Antigua. So go check it out. It's called Into the Wild with the EAG. So, the questions selected for our CAP study uh, were intended to capture public perception of the threats that exist to strawbirds and their habitats by also, by also knowing the existing knowledge about these birds, what people know, uh, people's existing knowledge about these birds and the general ability to distinguish a shorebird from a land bird. So as you can see in the, this question, we asked when asked uh, how polluted do you think Antigua's beaches are? Over 55% of the respondents believe that Antigua's beaches are 26 to is 26 to 50% polluted, uh, while over 27% believe that the beaches are 52 to 75% polluted. When asked how polluted do you think Antigua's mangroves are, over 45% of the respondents believe that 51 to 75% uh, is polluted, while 40% believe it is 26 to 25% polluted. So as you can see, the general knowledge of the public is that our beaches and mangroves are polluted. And finally, when asked whose responsibility is it to protect shorebirds and, and their habitats, over 95% of respondents understood that the protection of shorebirds and their habitat is everyone's responsibility and all believed that they could take action to protect shorebirds. And with that, we hope that through these activities and more individuals, with more individuals, we would have a greater understanding of not only shorebirds, about the shorebirds we have in Antigua and Barbuda, but also the wider Caribbean, but also the importance of safeguarding their environment and our environment for the benefit of them. Okay, so I would like to thank Birds Caribbean for allowing me to present this information to you and for continuing to assist the EEG in projects that help raise awareness of these birds, of these shorebirds. So EEG and the Wadali Wobblers uh, are currently working with Breast Caribbean on erecting educational shorebird signs around major shorebird habitats in Antigua and Barbuda to help deter illegal dumping. So we are doing, trying to get more involved in trying to get uh, signs that will probably give people information on how, who they need to contact when they see illegal dumping activities happen. And this would probably help cancel out or reduce the amount of illegal dumping that is currently happening in Antigua. So thank you for listening. If you want to follow the EEG, you can find us at EEG Antigua, either on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. So any questions? Thank you so much, Joshel. And thanks so much for all of your ongoing work with outreach and conserving wetlands in Antigua and Barbuda. Um, <laughs> we have uh, some questions. So Emma asks, is illegal dumping the main threat to wetland habitats? What about development as Antigua and Barbuda is also a tourism destination? So at the moment we do have like, we have a department of environment who looks at the impacts, like environmental impacts, whether you have to build a hotel somewhere. Uh, we have a good protect, we are protected areas. We have some good protected areas. So most of the wetland habitats that we have are that, we, that have illegal dumping are basically privately owned. So most of the times the government don't build on that area. So we do have more of a legal dumping problem than we have of a development problem at the moment for shorebirds, but development is always a problem overall. <laughs>
Um, one more question from Emma again. She's she asked several questions, but I'm going to pick one. <laughs> um, do your programs extend to the island of Barbuda? And um, how are you raising awareness uh, to help protect wetlands in that island? Oh yes, yeah. so our program does extend to Barbuda. So what part of our program is to reach out to other NGOs. So there's other NGOs in Barbuda, such as Barbuda Go. We partner with them. We give them counseling, we give them advice on how they could better protect their shorebirds, but they are doing a pretty good job in protection over there. So yeah, we do partner with them and we do help them and we do have that relationship with them. Okay, thanks so much. Um, we can move on to the next talk now. And then, like I said, we could go back to some of the other questions at the end of the uh, last talk. So now, as our final speaker tonight, we have Elijah Sands from the Bahamas. He works for the Bahamas National Trust. Um, he is going to be talking to us about uh, getting local people and local communities involved in mangrove restoration and conservation. So take it away, Elijah. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, and good evening, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining the webinar. Um, glad to be a part of this amazing lineup um, of presentations. Like Alex mentioned, um, my name is Elijah Sands. I'm the Senior Communications Officer at the Bahamas National Trust, um, which essentially is the National Park Service in the Bahamas manage a national park system of 2.2 million acres. Um, but we also um, engage in a lot of other activities, um, other elements of conservation, education, research, advocacy, you know, the whole nine yards. Um, so I want to get right um, into it. Um, this presentation, again, is about engaging local communities with local and also international communities in mangrove conservation and restoration um, and how, you know, what the problem is or, you know, what got us to this point and what are we doing and where are we trying to get. So I like to start off by talking about, you know, why are we restoring mangroves right now in the Bahamas? Um, as many of you may have known, um, in 2019, September 1st, 2019 specifically, a uh, Hurricane Dorian made landfall in the Bahamas as a category five um, climate charge superstorm with winds, um, sustained winds above 185 miles per hour and gusts um, that exceeded that. And this brought major destruction to the islands of Abaco and Grand Bahama, which are two northern islands in the Bahama archipelago. You know, hundreds of people were displaced. Um, unfortunately, we had some casualties as well. And Hurricane Dorian also wreaked incredible havoc on the environment. Um, pine forests, coral reefs, mangroves, you know, every habitat you can imagine were certainly significantly impact by Hurricane Dorian, um, displacing a lot of species and also kind of rendering useless a lot of these ecosystems that provide so many important ecosystem services, ecosystem services to both uh, people and the planet. To kind of hone in or focus on, you know, the impact that Hurricane Dorian had on mangrove habitats, uh, we, I'm presenting some of the summary from research that was done by Bonefish and Tarpon Trust um, after Hurricane Dorian. Um, more than 73% or 22,000 acres of mangroves in Grand Bahama uh, were devastated by Hurricane Dorian and more than 40% or just about 21,000 acres of Abaco's mangrove cover was destroyed in Hurricane Dorian. Um, as you can tell, um, this is extensive mangrove damage. We've never had anything like this in history that we could recall at least since we've been monitoring these sort of things um, that this much mangroves or this much habitat was destroyed by a single storm event. Um, these two um, islands, for the most part, have significant um, human populations. Um, they're the second and third most populated islands in the Bahamas. So, of course, you know, when we saw that this, when we saw the devastation caused by Hurricane Dorian, we knew right away that we needed an ambitious restoration program uh, to give these areas a jump start to recovery. And, you know, the reason why we do that, because, of course, you know, we're all very aware of the um, tremendous benefits that mangroves bring to both the end people and the planet. You know, we're aware that, you know, they are the supreme carbon sinks, sequestering carbon from our atmosphere and, you know, locking it away, you know, helping in the fight against climate change. We understand what they do for um, food security um, and also just, you know, their biodiversity hotspots. So we understand also that they are, you know, protectors of the shore. They protect our coastlines. They protect low-lying communities. A lot of communities in the Bahamas are very close to the shore and a lot of them are below or at sea level. So mangroves play a key role in protecting these communities um, during 
severe storm events like Hurricane Dorian. So they almost like they essentially sacrificed themselves in the role of protecting us. Um, specifically too on these two islands, you know, these mangrove habitats, because they're such biodiversity hotspots, they play a major role in tourism. Tourism is the number one industry in the Bahamas and it employs thousands, tens of thousands of Bahamians and it brings in millions, hundreds of millions of dollars to the Bahamian economy every year. Um, so these areas specifically, um, this mangrove restoration project definitely was going to be focused on restoring these areas because of all the ecosystem benefits they play or ecosystem benefits they bring to humans, um, specifically highlighting that ecotourism and tourism, especially fly fishing, is such an important industry on these two islands. And even though, you know, birds or shorebirds wasn't the focus of this, um, the focus species or species group of this restoration activity, of course, also shorebirds and birds generally would greatly benefit from this restoration work as well. The Bahamas is a very important um, winter, mar winter ground for migratory shorebirds. Um, we have about 16 species of shorebirds that spend time in the Bahamas, the majority of them being migratory species. And we also have several species of high conservation concern, a high conservation priority that spend time in the Bahamas. For example, the threatened in, threatened in some areas and endangered in other areas, um, the piping plover spends a lot of time in the Bahamas. And there are some sites that are considered some of the most important wintering grounds for piping plovers on the planet. So we knew, of course, by restoring um, these areas um, for marine life and for people, we're also greatly benefiting shorebirds as well. So we immediately sprang into action. Like I said, you know, we know we needed a ambitious mangrove restoration program. Um, so one of the first things we started doing is collecting propagules, collecting trees, trying to figure out how can we get our hands on natural matter to help start regenerating some of these forests. So propagule collection and growing red mangroves, right now red mangroves is the key species because those are the most mangroves that were damaged, you know, was a key part of the restoration program. And we got on these islands immediately, started rallying up people and getting them involved in collecting and growing mangroves. Of course, the um, other part of mangrove restoration certainly involves um, going out there and planting mangroves, you know, and involving everybody. Um, I would say the biggest thing for us, um, the biggest thing for everybody involved in this mangrove restoration work was collaboration. Um, we knew that the project was ambitious. We knew the goals that we set were ambitious. And we knew that the only way this would be successful, the only way this has worked, is we have buy-in and support and involvement from every facet of the community that we can, every facet um, of anybody who interacts with mangroves at any point. So we got other nonprofits involved, we got corporates involved, we got youth and school groups involved, and especially we have a lot of the anglers and fishermen and tour guides involved in this work, who are the people that you know understand the most, understand the most intimately how important these areas are to them, because they're the ones out there every day kind of making a living of it. So collaboration is the key part of this mangrove restoration work. Um, we prioritize um, raising awareness and getting people involved. Um, so, you know, again, the school groups were a big part of this, targeting the youth, making sure we let them know, um, make sure that they understand, you know, why we're doing this work. And I could say that everybody, I think, loves mangroves. Everybody loves to plant a mangrove. And it's a kind of rewarding experience when you feel like, you know, I've put this tree into the ground. And when you see these areas, you know, people are automatically inspired. Um, like, you know, we need to do something about this. A lot of the people involved in these pro this project right now have memories of what these areas looked like before Hurricane Dorian. And you just kind of get out in the boat or you walk around and you see just miles and miles of dead mangroves, you feel that urge to get involved. So, so far we've had tremendous success with um, getting different people from different walks of life involved in this mangrove restoration project. So specifically, who are we engaging in local communities? Again, um, we're high priority were fishermen and lodges and tour guides, because again, they're the ones who know these areas very well. They're the ones who benefit um, the closest of, from these areas and also the experts in the field, the experts um, in these areas. So we use, utilizing them to get around, utilizing them to tell us where we need to go and you know, what areas we need to restore. Of course, there were um, studies, hydrology studies, et cetera, done to determine, okay, what type of mangrove restoration should we be doing, you know, how we should be doing it. And we relied heavily on our partners for this. Um, we reached out to local businesses for collaboration, you know, so corporate companies, just about everybody, you know, we extended 
the invitation, or at least we made them know right away that, okay, anybody can get involved in this work. So corporate groups and civic groups, all those um, corporate companies, all those types of businesses could either um, support financially or in kind by volunteering um, to help us restore these mangroves. Um, we worked with a lot of local primary schools and high schools and university groups. Um, you know, a lot of times youth made up the bulk of our, um, volunteers during these planting activities. And we also invited local and national government officials. Um, you know, restoring these areas, you know, it benefits all of us, it, especially these local communities that are nearby to these ecosystems. We want government to know exactly what we're doing and how they could get involved. Um, and beyond that, so apart from just local communities and work on the ground, we also made sure that we had a, a strong presence, a powerful presence on the web to engage the international community. Um, of course, the you know key part of this work is the activities that happen on the ground. You know, collecting propagules, planting the red mangrove seedlings, looking after them, and then getting out there and getting muddy and planting these trees in these devastated areas. But of course, there's always a, a great financial need. So we made sure that we made a, a beautiful web page, a beautiful web space to let people know more about the project, what we're trying to do, what we're trying to achieve. And of course, the, the biggest point of the page is also to be an easy, simple, and effective fundraising mechanism. So anybody in the world who you know just happens to land on social media or just happens to search mangrove restoration or anything like that, we want them to be able to find us, learn about the work we're doing, learn about how they can support and make it very easy for them to support financially. And you know, one of the primary or one of the main um, events I like to highlight would be Given Tuesday. Um, as nonprofits, mainly all of us are very aware of Given Tuesday. It's the Global Day of Giving. We always take advantage of this day to raise money for our most urgent fundraising projects or our programs that need immediate funding or we think can be very successful on Given Tuesday. Like I mentioned, um, everybody loves mangroves, and that's just not locally. Um, that's internationally. Um, uh, the great thing is so many people are tuned into conservation. Conservation is now mainstream, in my opinion. So when we're talking about planting mangroves, that immediately clicks with people. It's something that seems attractive. Even if they can't participate on the ground, people still want to support. So we made a huge deal about mangroves on um, Given Tuesday last year, and we saw um, tremendous success. Uh, so just to give like some key highlights or some key um, statistics right now in terms of where we are, the success we've been seeing. Like I mentioned, we've seen a significant success with the Mangrove project so far. Some of these numbers are not finalized, but so far we've planted over 4,800 Mangrove seedlings um, in Grand Bahama. These are little trees that are already a few months to a year old, some a little over a year old. We planted over 4,000 Mangrove seedlings in Abaco as well. We've engaged over 200 local community members on the ground, and we've raised over $50,000 through online and in-person fundraising efforts. Again, um, I prepared the majority of this presentation for the um, AOSBC symposium, uh, sorry, conference. And you know we've also had more activities start to happen since then. So most of these numbers in some cases have doubled, some of these numbers have tripled. A new project we have started, a new part of this project that we even get, we've started to engage in now is collecting and planting mangrove propagules directly in the ground, um, which gives us way greater numbers right off the bat and it's less resource intensive. Instead of grabbing the propagules and planting them, we're just collecting them. Of course, it's all informed by science, but collecting them and putting them in the ground immediately. And today we've planted over, I want to say 20,000 mangrove propagules. I'll double check those numbers, but mangrove propagules just in the past month or two months. And of course, we've um, Mangrove Day was recent, International Day for the Conservation of Mangrove Ecosystems, aka Mangrove Day. And we had another big push online to raise money for mangroves. And we raised upwards of uh, $10,000 on that single day alone. And we've, of course, engaged way more community members since then. So we're seeing tremendous um, impact with this project, which is um, great news. There's still a long, long way to go. Um, we need millions of mangroves in the ground as soon as possible. And I'd like to acknowledge our partners, Rewild, Bonefish and Tap and Trust, Mine, Friends of the Environment, um, the Bahama Foundation, East End Lodge, um, Perry Institute for Marine Science, and others who've all been playing key roles in helping us to achieve um, the success we've seen with this mangrove restoration project. So with that, um, I will take any questions.
Thank you so much. It's such an amazing project in terms of the amount of mangroves you've planted and the people you've engaged and how much money you've raised. It's like so impressive. So thank you for sharing. Um, I think you answered a lot of people's questions during your talk, uh, but I have one question that looks like you probably didn't answer. Uh, so Miles Remain asks, what were some of the biggest challenges in terms of mangrove restoration during the pandemic? Oh, thank you for that question. Um, so, of course, during the pandemic, as we all know, they know everything kind of came to a screeching halt. Um, and that just means that there were less activities happening um, simply. Um, you know, there were less people getting out. Um, we weren't able to rally people together to do things because simply we just weren't allowed to kind of gather. Um, you know, one issue that probably was a bit more um, significant for us in the Bahamas has been a, a issue of, of scientific permits. We had like a kind of restructuring of the permitting process in the Bahamas and that kind of held up um, some of the mangrove restoration work. But in terms of during the pandemic, um, you know, just a lot of things just couldn't happen because people just literally physically couldn't get together. Lisa, you have some questions? Do you want to unmute and ask? <laughs> yes, sure. Um, hi, Elijah, great presentation. So one thing I'm curious about, um, what I've learned is that, you know, you have all that acreage of, of dead mangroves and it looks like it can be quite dense. Um, what I've learned is that you're not supposed to clear that to plant new mangroves, that you're supposed to like plant the propagules in amongst that. Were, is that what you were doing? And were you able to do that? Because I know it can be really hard to, to travel through um, really dense mangroves, whether alive or dead. So just curious how, how you manage that. Yeah, so thank you for that question. Um, certainly, um, you know, I'm just to disclaimer. Most I'm like more of the the communications and the fundraising part, observation part of this. I've been very involved, and I'm very grateful to be involved. But of course, we have a lot of the leading scientists in the nation, you know, advising us and our partners, and you know how to do a lot of this restoration. So mangroves are incredibly dense um, to uh, navigate, like you said. Uh, definitely, clearing them would be the probably the worst thing you definitely could do. Um, because some of these mangroves are starting to regenerate. Um, I was in Grand Bahama about two months ago, and I was actually surprised to see the amount of green. I was starting to see along the coastline and little patches of green in the devastated mangroves. So a lot of the um, work that has been happening with the seedlings so far has been kind of along the ridge. But again, you know, we've been informed by research in terms of, again, okay, which areas we need to be focusing on, because what we're also trying to do is make sure that for a lot of these areas we can reach, we can establish uh, a, basically a seed bank because our issue right now with the mangroves is not just that the mangroves are dying and not dead, but there is no fresh batch of like propagules coming in from anywhere because the damage is so extensive. Um, so just recently with the propagules, you know, I observed that, you know, we were kind of kind of tossing them kind of more into the mangroves and also just kind of releasing them in a strategic place that we think could float along with the tides. Um, another key thing is that um, planting, you know, along the fringes kind of, you know, immediate, immediately improves if the mangroves survive the structure of the, the creeks, et cetera, itself. Because what the worst thing that could happen is if the mangroves die and crumble, then you just lose a lot of the geography and things that kind of loose apart, you know, mangroves hold sediments together. So I'm um, using science to inform a lot of that about what's the most strategic places to be planting right now. Great. Thanks. Yeah, that's really good to hear. I know that in other islands, of course, we had Irma and Maria in 2017, which devastated so many islands and their mangroves. And I mean, it's fantastic that you got this initiative together, got everybody on board. Um, but in other islands, I would hear that it was used as an excuse to clear and develop because, oh my God, these are unsightly dead mangroves. Let's cut them all down. Let's let's build here. And so that was, we were getting reports of a lot of that happening in other islands that had lost a lot of mangroves from those hurricanes. So really good to be proactive, have you know the citizens engaged and aware right away. Like you said, more and more people are recognizing that planting mangroves is a good thing. So your your example is, is really great. I, I think I see, because I could kind of see the questions. I Sorry, I see one question about, um, has the website been effective on an international level? Um, I'd say 100%. Uh, a lot of our online for fundraising is, in fact, um, the streams are coming from international supporters. Um, that's the, you know, I think that's the big reason of why Certainly investing in a, a, a proper website, a, a modern website, a, a functional website is key to any nonprofit and key to any fundraising campaigns. Um, the simpler and more effective um, 
and more attractive you can make a well a online page is of an online fundraising mechanism, you'll be surprised how quickly it could become a steady stream of income or another really good finance mechanism for your nonprofit. Great. Okay. So we probably have time for a couple more questions. Squeeze them in. I'm gonna I, I see open my up to everybody's <laughs> questions. Yeah, I mean everyone can see the question. So if anyone sees a question in the QA they haven't answered, like you could jump in and answer it now. I think there was one question in the chat for Jody that didn't get answered. So Caroline Potts asked um kind of what's happening to the wetlands that are being that are kind of involved in these. Uh, development. So she says, are the wetlands being turned into retention ponds, integrated into sewage treatments, or filled? So, like, what's happening? Yeah. Um, in the case of the one in, so the one in Lassajess, um, which is at the the south of the island, southeast of the island, um, that is somewhat being turned into a smaller pond, um, and they're going to put some islands in it, I believe. There was talk about replanting mangroves, but I'm not sure where that is. The wetland in that is closer to that one. Um, it's it's unclear. It looks like they're going to modify them, the wetland pretty heavily. Um, I wish I had a, the, the closer pictures, but it looks as though they're going to put uh, some massive infrastructure in there. So it's unclear what's going to happen with that one. And then the one in the north of the island, the development plan shows um, rides in there. It shows um, some diversion of water to allow people to, I guess, kayak outside. Um, it, it's going to, it suggests that all three of them will be heavily, heavily, heavily modified. Um, and they'll be part of the attractions themselves or hotel developments themselves. But the plans, that's based on the plans we've seen. We don't know what's what's changed since then. So I'd say heavily modified. Okay, great, thanks. So do we have time for any more questions, Lisa, or should we wrap it up? <laughs> uh, we could stay on for a couple more questions, sure. Yeah, have you spotted any? I feel like a lot of them have been answered because you guys have been doing a really good job of answering them in the chat or in the, in the Q and A. Um, I'm I just looking through. I see um, one question um, asking if, have you seen an impact on the shorebird population as a result of the mangrove restoration project, or is it too early? Um, so I would say, yes, it is slightly too early. Um, we are doing, our partners and the BNT are doing some monitoring. Um, a lot of it's kind of really focused on the actual growth um, of the, the mortality rate um, or the success of the plantains and the rate of growth or the growth rate of the mangroves. Um, I don't really know if there are any really major shorebird monitoring efforts, but I'm sure along with like um, marine assessments, we'll be monitoring um, biodiversity generally um, in these restored areas. And to just another question, not related to shorebirds, but just I see, see it three times about North Andrews mining project. I dropped our response um, in the chat and an update on the project. Great. Thanks, Elijah. Yeah, I saw that. Um... Fantastic. You have to get people out to do CWC surveys in uh, January in your some of your mangrove restoration sites. Uh, Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, I was going to say I was there in February in Grand Bahama. Um, this was for Erica Gates Memorial, and we did go out and survey a bunch of wetlands, and I could see all the miles of dead mangrove, and in a lot of areas there were no birds, but on one inland wetland, there was tons of herons and egrets where the mangroves were still healthy, they, they were alive. So they were all concentrated in this one spot, but definitely get the Grand Bahama Island birders out there. Um, I think Dolores was on this on this webinar, so she and her crew can definitely do some surveys for you. Fantastic. Okay, so I think we can wrap things up now. Uh, so thank you all for the amazing talks. Um, it's really inspiring to hear these stories, even the. The really sad story about what's happening in Grenada is really important for us to hear about um, and learn from. And thank you to everyone else for coming along this evening and all your questions and engagement in the chat. And don't forget that we are going to do part two featuring some more talks from the symposium in the summer in October. And I will post the dates for that soon.
Um, so yeah, I think that's we're all good. <laughs> Thank so, you so much, for speakers, and thanks for everyone to attend that attended. We we appreciate it. Yeah. So everyone have a good evening. Yeah. Good night, everybody. Thanks so much. Great. Good night. Bye for now.